This episode is brought to you by Heidi. Imagine kicking back while a HIPAA compliant AI scribe writes your soap notes for free. Yes, you heard us right, Heidi is free. I'm Dr. Tom, Heidi's CEO and founder, and we started Heidi to stop clinicians wasting their life on clinical documentation. Heidi transforms your consult babble into crisp, clear soap notes, personalizing itself with every edit. One day, Heidi will be your AI resident, looking through research, explaining plans, and doing anything you don't want to. If you currently pay for an AI scribe in your practice, you should swap to Heidi. We'll even credit you for anything you've already paid. Dive into the description for the link and make your practice the envy of every stethoscope in town. Sign up and watch Heidi work its magic all for free because you've got better things to do. Welcome to the Physician's Guide to Doctoring podcast as part of our esteemed contributor series. I'm your host, Dr. Christine Goins. Today, I'm thrilled to introduce an exceptional guest, Dr. Calvin Sun, board certified emergency medicine physician, published author, speaker, and entrepreneur based in New York City. Dr. Sun's journey is nothing short of remarkable spanning across various fields from medicine to filmmaking and global travel adventures. In this episode, we'll delve into Dr. Sun's multifaceted career, exploring the motivations that led him to blend his medical expertise with entrepreneurship and a passion for travel. We'll also uncover the unique advantages and challenges he faced along the way, providing our audience with valuable insights and inspiration. So join us for a captivating conversation as we navigate the intersections of medicine, entrepreneurship, and wanderlust in Dr. Sun's extraordinary journey. Hey, this is Brad Block, host of The Physician's Guide to Doctoring. This is a personal and professional development podcast for physicians where we have experts on the show that try to teach us everything we should have been learning while we were memorizing Krebs cycle. We are about to embark on an exciting journey through our guest's exceptional experiences and delve into the inspirations, the obstacles, and the gratifications of intertwining a career in medicine with the dynamic world of travel and entrepreneurship. But first, let me extend a warm welcome to our esteemed guests. I want you to meet Dr. Calvin Sun, board certified emergency medicine physician, published author, speaker, entrepreneur based in New York City, graduating from Columbia University and Sunny Down State College of Medicine. Dr. Sun has not only excelled in emergency medicine, but has also worn the hats of a filmmaker, speaker, and explorer. As the founder of the Monsoon Diaries, Dr. Sun's solo travel blog, initiated during his first year of medical school, evolved into an accidental adventure travel company. The Monsoon Diaries has taken thousands of people to over 190 countries and territories, earning recognition from BBC News, ABC News, Huffington Post, Business Insider, and more. Beyond his medical expertise, Dr. Sun has been actively involved in resident wellness and served as the chief medical officer for the New York City Marathon. His firsthand reporting during the 2019 to 2020 coronavirus pandemic in New York City emergency rooms is chronicled in his memoir, The Monsoon Diaries. So today we have the privilege of unraveling Dr. Sun's extraordinary journey, exploring the intersections of medicine, entrepreneurship, and a passion for a global exploration. Welcome, Dr. Sun. Thank you, Dr. Goins. Good to be here. I'm so glad to have you here. I know that for me, your journey has been really, really remarkable. And I'm wondering, you know, if you could share with us just how it all began and including that pivotal moment when you decided to combine your medical career with a passion for travel and exploration. Where do accidents begin? How do accidents happen? That's my answer. I guess it does sound remarkable hearing you intro me, but to me, it still feels like I'm in a sense of disbelief that it's describing me. Sometimes I look in the mirror and I'm like, who are you? I just disembodied out of body experience because I do feel a lot of imposter syndrome still that I am this person that you describe. I'm just a little kid, 11 year old kid, just snowboarding through the world, not knowing what to do and how I'm doing it. Still haven't really 
figured out why or what I'm doing, but now looking back and realizing it's all been a happy accident. I guess the best answer is that it begins every minute. There's no discrete beginning. Every moment that I'm living right now has been an opportunity for self-discovery. It's an active process. Like I'm still beginning something right now. I'm planting seeds right now. Every trip that I do, even though it's the 60th, 70th trip I've done, I've lost count this point. It's always the planting the seed for the next trip or even the trip three years from now. A lot of the trips that I do now were things that had formed from serendipity that have four or five years ago that at the time I had no idea why it was happening, but I knew it was going to mean something. And even if it didn't, I decided to ascribe meaning to it, knowing that eventually it'll turn out. And it usually does. You plant seeds everywhere. Some bloom, some don't. And I guess if you really want to know where it began, you can always start that the moment I was born. I never really had a family that I grew up with. My mom was always in Jersey. My dad was in Connecticut. I was in New York City. I was raised by a family of babysitters and never had a very normal childhood. Every month I had a different babysitter to take care of me because my parents were working really hard out of state and I wouldn't see them a few days at a time. So my whole understanding of love and belonging, which I was given to, I was very grateful for the education, all that my parents provided, but the emotional place where I created a sense of belonging was through many different experiences from many different strangers. And over time, when my dad died when I was 19 from a sudden heart attack and my mother got diagnosed with Parkinson's, I've always been really on my own trying to figure out meaning and never coming to an answer, but at least constantly still being present and living without any idea what the next step would look like. And not having a plan, always feeling like everything was an accident, always feeling like even getting to medical school was an accident and feeling like an imposter. How I got to travel, I lost a bet while bartending. I thought I was going to be a bartender for the rest of my life after my dad died. He died when I was in college. And that was when I was like, okay, I can do whatever I want. I don't have to be a doctor anymore. So I became a bartender. And that led to a bet that made me go to Egypt 36 hours later. And that was an accident, I felt that led me to realize what travel was all about. And then that was at the same time that I decided to take a bet on applying to every medical school, seeing if I would not get in everywhere, check that box off and be done with that decision. That also was in the moment, I was very frank when I was applying that I don't think I should be a doctor, but the only way I would know whether I was deciding not to become a doctor because I was gonna rebel against my dad or I was actually meant to be, but then if I did, then I would give in. I didn't know the right answer. So just apply with my terrible GPA, my below average MCAT score with a lot of recommendation letters that said, I don't think he should be a doctor. <laughs> and my advisor were like, I don't know how to endorse you. So I'll just tell the truth. And I told the truth. It was just by accident. I feel that downstate was like, hey, we want to take a chance on you. We want trying something different. We want doctors that can talk to people. You know, you have life experience. And I didn't expect to get in. And then keeping that going at the same time, while as a full-time travel blogger, without skipping any class or missing anything and trying to balance both, hoping that one of them will pan out. It would be then as an accident right now where both of them pan out. I'm doing both at the same time as an attending and as a full-time traveler. So, I mean, we can go in more depth. That's like the framework on how I start off that answer. But now looking back, I feel like it's an accident. And I have thousands of people in this community that keeps coming on my trips, whether I go somewhere like last week, I was in Canary Islands in Spain and last month to Syria, 16 people came on that. So no matter where I go, people show up. That is so beautiful. And I love how, you know, you talk about this accidental nature of, you know, how you got involved in medicine, how you began your blog, how you began taking people on all these amazing trips. But at the same time, it's not really accidental because there is this flow that is happening from the time you were born until now where all of these moments are interconnected and you see how each of the periods that even if they seem like an accident at the time, how they connect to an overall bigger purpose or meaning to what you've actually created. Yes, it's definitely not as the whole episode progresses, we'll find out that it's not truly an accident. A lot of hard work was put into it, but the intention behind it that I want to convey is that I had no idea why I was doing it or what I was doing, but I knew that it was real and authentic. And I just kept doing it, even if I didn't have to know what the ultimate goal was. I didn't expect that I would travel as much as I did when I first started traveling. I didn't expect to get into medical school or let alone finish med school 
when I started it. And I didn't expect or let alone want a community of people to come on my solo trips when I started the Monsoon Diaries. All of that is now has have happened and is happening. But I think it only came to fruition because I didn't expect it. I learned to instead of creating the process or planning the process, instead of that, I chose to trust the process and live the process without having to know what the answer was. And that, I think, organic trusting in the present left me with enough room to, instead of trying to get attention, to actually pay attention what mattered the moment. And whatever happens and whatever the plant looked like at the end, whatever I was watering, I didn't care what it looked like at the end because I knew that whatever it will turn out, I would have to trust it. Rather than what most people I feel try to do is they have an idea what they want something to look like, and then they plan for it. And it works for them, and I'm happy for them. And then maybe this isn't for you if you're happy doing that. But I worry that if you are putting all that resource, all that energy into that outcome, then once it does happen and you have it in your hands and it came exactly how you planned it, you'd be so bored. You'd be like, that's it? Everything turned out exactly according to plan? Then life is not a surprise. And if it's not a surprise, then what's, where's the beauty in that spontaneity? So how do you get to that place. You know, I I totally agree with you. People have like an idea and then they want to kind of create like a step-by-step plan of how they would actually create that. But when you're co-creating with the universe, usually things turn out (laughs) differently, maybe than you had planned, but maybe in a more extraordinary way than you could have ever thought of before. So how did you kind of make that shift? Or is that something that you always thought about in terms of your process of how you go about things or for other people who are very strategic in all of their decisions, how do they begin to kind of let go and kind of go more into that place of co-creation? I think the answer is you just said it, let go. Once you let go, then you are let go. I had to learn that the hard way when I was 19, when my dad had suddenly died from a heart attack, we had gone to an argument and I would, under the pretense I was gonna go work in the lab that he wanted me to work in, but actually snuck off and to hang out with my friends. And after the argument, he went on a treadmill at the New York sports club down in Soho and then had a heart attack and dropped dead. And by the time I went to the hospital, he was already gone. And my mom was diagnosed with Parkinson's that year. My partner at the time, she broke up with me (laughs) right after the funeral, it felt like. That whole summer was all about just teaching me that you everything you've planned out is BS. The universe will laugh if you think that you have everything strategized and planned out. And I think that it fit me learning that that lesson that the universe is inherently chaotic and you instead of trying to make all these contraption and make it fit for you, just accepting that and rolling with it, becoming one with entropy than trying to force the universe. You're just one person against the universe to bend it to your will. It will bend, quote unquote, to your will if you are bending with the universe. It's a symbiotic relationship rather than something that you're trying to force against nature. And if you want to put the energy in trying to do that, then you you have to deal with the consequences, which it may be more difficult than you really need to make it to be. And I mean, this is a balance for me because a good lesson for me, because I am actually inherently tight like if you say the Myers-Briggs, the J, I plan out everything. I mean, I am very strategic and Excel spreadsheets for everything. But I, knowing that part of myself, instead of going full 100% on planning the planning the plan, I also plan the unplannable. I create a space where I would say anything goes. I would even plan that. Like this is a time where I will let anything happen and I'll just go with it and I cannot complain. I'm not going to rewrite the ship. So if the light turns green, I'm going to keep walking. I don't even if it's the wrong direction. And when it turns red, I'm going to make a 90 degree and turn the other direction. Like things like that, where I just let it guide me because it's the right balance to my inherent nature, which is to plan everything. So this answer is for the people who tend to think they over plan. I would say balanced by planning to not plan things. And if you're someone that is more of a P for Myers-Briggs, if you believe in that, more like let things happen as they may, add a little structure to that, but the, the inherent part of you is the magic. And I, and I personally think that the times when there's things that don't go according to plan, I choose to see that as the magic, but I'm not completely letting go of the my inherent DNA is to plan everything. Yeah, I really love that, that idea of 
really shaping how you want to view and what your perspective is going to be on what happens, even if it's something that you didn't initially plan. Because how you view it is going to impact you know, how you feel, how you show up in the experience that you're there to have, how you interact with the people that are around you. So vital and so important. I'm wondering with, you know, when you talk about this balance between both planning and then leaving space for the unplannable, for the adventure, for, you know, all the unknown, what motivated you to share like your travel experiences and how did it transform into a collective that now takes thousands on these adventures every year? I think it's a great addendum to the last answer that I gave is that for, or in order for that to happen, there has to be a high degree of self-awareness. You have to know the person that you are so that you know what, how to balance it. So I knew early on that I'm a planner because I enjoy it. And I therefore had to make a mantra and habit of doing things that made me uncomfortable, which was to balance that out with being spontaneous and letting go of the plan. Let go and you're let go. There's one thing about knowing what to do, but then I needed something to have that spark. And unsadly, the spark for me was early on when my dad died, when the universe forced me a lesson saying, here's your spark. There's no greater visceral learning lesson than to lose a loved one suddenly. One minute he, you're arguing with him, he had full of life, and the next minute he's gone. And then the rest of the summer, my mom, you know, that day my dad died, I went home alone. My mom went from the emergency room with me to her parents' place because she couldn't, you know, live alone. And so therefore I went home alone and accepted that was normal. When your parent dies, you go home with the other parent. Well, no, my other parent didn't want to go home with me. She said, bye. And I went home having to accept that. And when my friends found out, they thought I was crazy. They were like, I'll be right there. I'm okay. I actually enjoy this weird freedom that I'm having. I mean, I was very sad, and but also was trying to reframe that as like, I'm enjoying this space of, of knowing myself. And that's a space that was created for me to know what kind of person I was to let me to realize I, what I need to balance with. Now, I'm not wishing that for everyone. So... I don't think people should go to that kind of trauma. It's terrible. But a way to control that trauma is how I was able to share this with everyone was I also kept a diary since I was six years old. I was very lonely. I was not allowed to have friends. My parents really kept my, um, even though they were never around, they created an environment where I felt guilty hanging out with other people other than the people that were uh, hired as my babysitter that taking care of me. And so I, I wrote and I wrote to myself and I've ever, I kept it since I was six years old and I kept documenting things so that hopefully one day I would have an opportunity to re-examine my life. I wasn't sharing it with the world that led them to now come on my trips. I was sharing it with my future self and the world happened to like pay attention. The world happened to pay attention that I was writing to myself. I wasn't trying to get attention. I hate how people would say like, oh, I want to start a blog so other people can read it. That was not my intention. I started a blog so I, the future Calvin can talk to the young Calvin one day because I had no one else to talk to. I didn't expect people would actually care and read about it. So when I started a blog to travel, it was really for my future self to know the motivations behind why I was traveling, to remind myself, to this day, I still read the Egypt trip where, yeah, remember 36 hours ago, you met a girl at a bar and she jo half jokingly dared you to go to Egypt and you took her up on it. You lost the bet and then boom, there you are. And there's a photo of you two to remind myself the kind of person that I was just in case in the future me, I'm not, I'm less spontaneous. I'm not as fun as I want to be. And I'm maybe going through some kind of mid quarter or third life crisis. I can have a living document evidence to read back on that still exists to this day right now to remind myself the kind of person I was. But then over time, because I guess of that authenticity of writing to myself, people are inherently voyeuristic. They want to read your deep vulnerable thoughts, especially if you're being vulnerable and you're not, and you're writing as if you're not expecting anyone to care, read it. People start to read it. That's the irony. And then they said, wow, I want to be part of this. This guy is traveling and I can tell he's not traveling to get attention or get me to come. So that means I want to come because I'm sick and tired of traveling people who is trying to get me to come to the other trips. I don't want to go to another this tour or that tour who is trying to make money. I don't want to make a rich person richer. I want to Go with this guy because he's thoughtful and wants and is rights. And maybe I want to write along with him. Maybe I want to be a writer. And in the beginning, I told the people to screw off, go away. 
I was like, I don't want you on my trips. This is a solo trip for me to write to myself. And I'm only going for Friday and Saturday before I have to get back to school on Monday. I left Friday, travel on Saturday, got back Sunday so I could make it to class Monday in med school. And then people was like, that's awesome. That fits in my schedule too. You can fit all that in a weekend. You do all the work for me because you already planned everything. And remember, I like planning. And then eventually they kept pushing me. I, I didn't interview the people who traveled with me. They would say, remember, I remember Calvin's first trip. He literally turned around and he's like, no one asked you to come when we complained that he was walking too fast. That's what, that was my first reaction. It was kind of like Forrest Gump running around the country after Jenny breaks up with him for the 10th time. He turns around and these all these people are following him and he still has no idea why they're doing it. An accident to his point of view. But I think it was a happy accident now that I turn around and there's thousands and thousands of people who have traveled with me, many of them their 15th, 16th, 20th trip with me and who pay me to keep traveling and I'm only happy to have them come along. I mean, you have to pay me back because I'm not paying for your trip. And the volume wise has now created something that's actually sustainable. So I think the ultimate lesson is instead of trying to get attention, pay attention to yourself, pay attention to the being the present, create space for yourself and the right people will follow. Or for some of you older people listening out there, remember this movie, if you build it, they will come. For sure, for sure. And, and that's really powerful. I love how you really talk about the passions that you have, whether it's writing and really wanting to prepare for your future self, be able to talk to your future self, how you've kind of combined all of these elements, including the planning into really a business that also is able to touch so many other lives. I'm wondering for you, it sounds like travel has really been transformative. How do you believe the travel that you do with others? How does it empower those individuals? And what transformations have you witnessed in those who actually join on your global adventures? Oh my, like literally every trip. I just had one last week. It was like only 72 hours or like four days long, three to four days long. And like within three hours is already eventful and impactful. And I'm like, oh, there's no dull trip. I can't have, I actually was like, I kind of just wanted one trip where it was just okay. Like just no, it's just friends who've been on a million trips with me and we can just kick back and just have it easy. But really all my trips have been transformative. The conversation was super deep. It, it's weird because my trips attract, self-select the right people. It's not like I say, I'm going to France. Then you get everyone. There's no, there's no self-selection. So I don't say France. I say maybe a, a southern road trip on the coast of France. In this case, I didn't say Spain. I said Canary Islands. So the Canary Islands self-select a certain group of people who are all un unique in their own different way, never met one another, but all they all shared some kind of weird thing in common, which they all lost a parent. That was so weird when we all got together for dinner. And then like, so what brings you here? Like, nice to meet, literally nice to meet you. What well, brought you here? And then 10 minutes later, it was like, wait a minute. Your dad just died last year. His mom just died last year. And everyone knows about my dad. <laughs> whoa, 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 what's going on here? And they, everyone's like, no, I just signed up a trip because I wanted to go to the Canary Islands. It looks beautiful. When I, I and, and I do trips like Syria and, you know, in next, next month, uh, in three weeks, I'm going to the West Africa from Nigeria to Ghana. And that self selects certain people, which I already, the two of them are born in the same year, 1971. They're like born in the same year, two people, and they happen to want to be roommates, but they never met each other before. But they're like, oh, someone's born in the same year. That's wild. And usually my trips are, are, are people in their 30s and 40s, but these are two 50 plus year old. I mean, we have age ranges all over, but the ones that are older, happen to have the same birth year. Who knows what else they might share? Like, it's just, wow, trusting the process. So I, I think that that in itself is already transformative. The fact that you are signing for a trip where you wouldn't otherwise sign up for, and someone else out there also is making the same exact decision. You two have not met yet, but because of this, this thing that has attracted both of you, similar people do similar things maybe, if you don't believe in magic, or maybe it's magic that you two are meant to meet each other and talk about this, have this shared experience together for only three to four days and never see each other again. But you know that it was the quality and not quantity. And it's like, that's what a soulmate is. Elizabeth Gilbert kind of soulmate where that person really sees you for where you are and within seconds knows you 
just deconstructs your entire narrative and of reality. And then you never see that person again because you're not supposed to stay with that person that, you know, it's not stable to live with someone that's so destabilizing, but they get you, they see you and they'll always will be a part of your life. Even if you stay in touch or never stay in touch with them ever again. I think that's what our trips are. They're short and they're sustainable in that they're short. So you can don't have to use your PTO or vacation time or take days off of school Friday to Sunday. They're really quick. And if you want to take longer, I'll stay longer because I'm in a place now where I can't. But back then I was only doing short trips. So other people can come along and I make them as cheap as possible because I'm not doing it for the money. I'm, I'm going to be a doctor. And back then I was saying, I'm going to be a doctor. This is an IOU. And you just, you know, just pay back what you owe, like a bunch of friends. But then the volume came where more people started bringing their friends and their friends. And I, you know, the math is I'm not going to lower the costs like halfway through the trip because they brought their friends last minute to join midway through the trip. And eventually it started paying for other trips and it just became transforming that people were, I think, were paying for the, for authenticity. Something that we don't get enough with our friendships these days. And, and I think people just come together and it's artificial. They just want to have fun and party and then see you next week and do the same thing all over again, which is fun. Like you need that. We all need that little bit of junk food that we eat over and over and over again. I already know what a Snickers bar tastes like. I'll still have that Snickers bar, but it's not something I can live on for the rest of my life. I want something more real, organic and whole foods because I want to live a longer life and I can't just eat Snickers. And I think as people get older, they need the latter more the authentic relationships. And that's what we provide as a community for you to meet other people who you have not yet met, but you can connect with. And I think that's what we provide in these spaces. But that's only my answer looking back. In the moment, I had no idea. In the moment, I was like, I just want to travel here. And if you want to come along, great. You can hold my camera as I run to the bathroom or wait in the bus line for me. That was it. That was in the moment. But then deep down, I was like, something is bringing these people together. Now, since I've done this for 13 years, I'm more aware of it. It's like, uh huh. So that's why last week, the first day, I was like, you lost a parent. You lost a parent. You lost what? Why? This is too weird. Like that was not part of the screening or interview process. So what serendipity? And then next, and I already know next three weeks from now, it's like, you were born the same year. You're born the same year. I mean, maybe I'm assigning forcing meaning or assigning meaning, but that's how I choose to live life. And I think that earnestness is what provides that energy so that other people feel comfortable being a little weird and assigning meaning to things that they think that other people wouldn't. And I think that's the beauty of it. Just trust the process. I really, really love that. So it's people actually looking towards their own inspiration and they've been inspired to join you. And in that moment, they get connected and so many beautiful things can come out of that. I mean, travel, it sounds really, really amazing the, the way that you kind of create these pockets of time for people to connect in that way. And travel has that ability to, to be so transformative. I'm wondering, you've been doing this for 13 years now. Entrepreneurship itself and sometimes travel can come with some challenges. Can you share any like hurdle that you faced in building you know, the Monsoon Diaries, how you navigate it, any kind of lessons you learned from that? I think it was these three things. First of all, was I didn't want it to be a business or entrepreneurship because I was worried that it would take the authenticity out of the whole process. I didn't want to make money. People started paying me. They're like, I'll pay you. Like, how much was that? There was, I think I remember it was like someone was like, oh, how much do I owe you for this trip? The trip's already over. And I was like, oh, it was like $400 for the hotel and the lodgings. I here's my little black book. And they're like, $400? How are you fording this? Like, I was prepared to pay you $2,000. And I was like, okay, I'll take your $2,000. And they're like, you can't do that. That's illegal. You're not a business. It's like, oh, okay, I'll take your four. Just give me $400. And then we were just like, that's not, you're not making it. It's like, I don't want it to be a business because then if I make it a business, I'm going to treat it like my job. I'm in medical school. Come on. Like, I don't, I'm okay. Like, I already owe $300,000 in tuition. So maybe that twelve hundred or, or that $2,000 that you wanted to give me was welcome. But I'm a bartender. Like, I'll make it up. Like, this is not about the money. I don't want to be enslaved to the concept of money guiding this. It's, I want true, authentic experiences. And, I, and I, technically, I didn't even ask you to come. I wanted to go alone. And you you wanted me to take you along. I mean, I don't say no, but I'm. I'll, you, it's, you could see it in my face. I'm annoyed. Like, I don't want... I wanted to be like had a meet. I wanted me time. I'm I'm class president. I was class president in med school, so obviously I'm giving a lot of myself to everyone in my class. I knew everyone's name. I was throwing 
every uh, the events are all my class. So when I went on a when I went on a trip, I just wanted to like recharge on my own. But I couldn't say no because I kind of and just was curious what why that person would want to come on my trip. Just like I'm curious how you found me. It's that curiosity that I think drove me to say yes. And I think the hard part of turning into business was accepting that people wanted to pay me to share that experience with me. They were paying for authenticity. And I don't think they knew that. I mean, no one said like, I'm paying for authenticity. You guys are real. Just, no one said that. I think it made me because they wanted to go to see the Canary Islands. They wanted to go visit Syria or they, at the time they wanted to because visit this country. And they, But I think something stirred in them and I witnessed that. And I think now I'm able to see that what people want is an experience that has no expectations. I think I was already communicating that body language wise, but I wasn't able to literally express that out loud in a salesmanship tactic. We're going to be no expectations. But I think because of the, I think body language is like the most honest language we can have. Bodies don't lie. I, I'm a dancer. I love dancing because of the idea that, you know, when you communicate with another human being ex without words, that's very honest. And I think the way I carry myself, the way I wrote and expressed, maybe the body language of my photos, I spoke to someone else though reading out there and I was like, this, this, I can't explain it, but this is the person I want to travel with. And I think over time, I mean, I can say those now because they stuck in my life to actually say like, yeah, it was a weird feeling. And I saw you and I was like, I had to go. And it's not just one person. This is like, many different people who all like, yeah, I felt an intuition and something told me I had to go. And I've seen and heard enough of this as a pattern to now be able to confidently say, looking back, people are attracted to that kind of realist realism. And when that then becomes a business, that's where I had to, the hard part was transitioning that, accepting that I had to call this a business because one day on my birthday, my, my friend, uh, my best friend in college, incorporated it as a business, surprising me. And it's like, yep, here's $350. I put $350 down to turn this to an LLC in your name. And this is it. I'm handing you the keys. You got to turn this. You're me. He believed in me more than I believed in myself. So now it became a business because he insisted that I had to at this point. So many people were coming my trips and paying me and I wasn't taking a dime off of it. And eventually the volume wise was now is generating profit. And he's like, I don't want you to get in trouble for this when if someone misreads it. So luckily he came along. So again, accident. On my birthday was an accident. Uh, and then that became a business. And then the the second, the, the other two things, and it was a long answer from the first two, but the next two are really easy. When I finished my first trip and I started med school, the monsoon diet at the time was just the blog. And I didn't know what I was going to do with it when I started medical school. So I actually didn't plan on traveling during med school until... One day someone called me and said, your, your cousin's getting married and we want you to come to San Diego. And I'm like, ah, I didn't know you were getting married. She's like, well, that's why we tell people two months ahead of time. And I was like, shoot, I mean, I have an exam on Monday and your wedding's on a Saturday. Should I do it? And I was like, you know what? I'm burnt out. I've never been to San Diego before. It's San Diego. Let me go. And then I found tickets that were cheap and I flew over studying on the plane and came back. And I was like, well, I barely passed the exam Monday, but I also got to go to San Diego. And you know what? I felt kind of happy. I made, I did both. I feel so good about that. Okay. I'm going to do the next thing. And then and I think my brother was like, your dad's death and his family, his company needs issues. Da, 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 da. We need to go to Hong Kong. And I'm like, I got to go to Hong Kong. It's like, yeah, it's, you know, and I has, and I had another end of semester exam on Monday. It's like, all right, I'll, I'll guess I'll go to Hong Kong in a 20 hour turnaround. So it's been 20 hours to go to Hong Kong on a Friday, right after class. Spent 20 hours on a Saturday to figure out what my dad's issue was after his death with his company. And then 20 hours to come back, studying on the airplane each way. And I barely passed. I was not an honor student. I was bottom half of my class. And my SUNY Downstate does the honors high pass, pass, conditional fail. So it's kind of like an A, B, C, D, F thing. Well, every other medical school is pass, fail. So I was P, 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 which is essentially C minus, C minus, C minus, C minus, C minus. But I was barely passing and I was got to go to Hong Kong and I made a friend in Hong Kong that is to this day, one of my closest friends that just introduced me to a, a cafe that's open around the corner that I'm now taking friends to that is staying over today. Like you see the seeds that were planted 10, 13 years ago. I met someone in that 20 hours in Hong Kong and I met her on Tinder to then stay in my life so much that it's impacting even my today right now because I see everything as a potential seed. So that's when I decided to keep traveling in med school. But at the time, the difficulty was not knowing what to do with a blog that was meant to just last in the summer. At the time, when I started the blog the summer before med school, 
I had expected to like not to drop out of med school, not, not even start it. And I was just focused on the, that's how focused I was on the present, the monsoon tires. I had no idea what was going to turn out, out to be. And I was like, so what people ask me, so what, what happens after this three month trip? My first trip with the monsoon tires was a three month trip through all of Southeast Asia and India. And during the middle of it, they were asking, so what happens to the monsoon diaries after this three month trip is over? And I had no idea. That's how invested I was in the present. And I didn't care to see what it looked like. I just trusted it will turn to something. And then 13 years later, by not knowing, the difficulty of not knowing what your entrepreneurship could look like, even not knowing it was going to be something entrepreneurial is what is actually, I think, the irony of the seed that makes it to what it is today. And lastly, the, the third thing was COVID. When COVID happened, all travel shut down. It was unethical to travel during COVID. Not that you could in the first place. You would get in trouble. So when COVID happened, people then asked, so what happens to the monsoon guys if you can't travel? We, at the time, we didn't know how long COVID was going to last. One year, two years, three years. And I said, well, I don't know. Don't care that we shouldn't travel. I don't care about the traveling part. We have a pandemic. And luckily, or accidentally, I happened to be a doctor. Of all doctors, I was an emergency doctor. And because I didn't believe in working for anyone or having a boss, I was per diem everywhere. So I worked in every emergency room in New York and got a sense of what was COVID like for every emergency room in New York, as opposed to most doctors in New York who worked for only a single hospital system. So then I was now communicating and, blo- and because I was already blogging full time as a traveler for new experiences and adventures, I mean, COVID was not the adventure I signed up for, but I decided to shift that habit of blogging of new experiences into COVID. And this time was impactful in terms of a life and death thing for me, writing hopefully for myself in the future or whoever was there to pick up the pieces to look back and one day know what happened for our first pandemic of our modern lifetimes. And that was what got other people to pay attention while I was just writing for myself. This is what happened today in this hospital. This is what happened in that hospital, in this hospital. And then people started asking the Monsoon Diaries to be interviewed on their whatever news sources, whether it was BBC, CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, even Newsmax wanted to interview me because of my experiences that was unique because I was everywhere, just like I was everywhere in med school. And uh, being able to describe that is what got Monsoon Dyers, ironically, to get the, the viewership that it has to this day. The irony is not lost on me that it took a travel ban to get a travel blog, the viewership that it, it now has. And that's what had Harper Collins and my travel agent to approach me, my now literary agent to approach me and say, hey, I wanna turn your story into a book without me even asking for it. So again, it feels like an accident, but at the time I think I was just planning, a lot of my friends are like, he's not planting seeds, he's just throwing seeds everywhere. I'm just throwing it, just taking a bag of seeds and just throwing it. And that's how I wanna live life, I guess. I, I didn't know I was doing that, but and now it takes friends and now who have been on my trips to say, Calvin's not a seed planter. We have people who plant seeds and know what they're doing. Calvin has no idea what he's doing. He is doing the effort of throwing seeds wherever it grows. Are you looking to diversify your investment portfolio and maximize your returns? By learning short-term investing skills, you can yield higher returns at compressed speeds by creating income on a daily and weekly basis. Today's sponsor, Lightspeed Investing, has amassed over a decade's worth of success and experience in this field to teach you how to leverage the futures in commodity financial markets. Inspired by the billionaire and natural gas trader, John Arnold, Lightspeed Investing has built a proprietary training and educational platform. For more information, connect with President and CEO, Philip J. Hawk Chan on LinkedIn, where you can start your journey towards financial freedom and abundance at light speed rates like many medical professionals already have. It sounds like you have ideas of of what you want and what you're looking for, but it doesn't like anchor you. You're not like tied to the particular outcome and you just kind of move through life in such this freeing way that allows everything that you ultimately could have wanted to just be attracted to you anyway, whether it's like connections, whether it's people, whether it's opportunities, whether it's more exposure that you know, helps to create and transform experiences for other people. It's all able to happen in this way that allows you to, to also maintain your own freedom. I'm just thinking about all the different things that you mentioned. So being a writer, being, you know, an entrepreneur, being a 
emergency physician, a speaker, you know, it's no small feat to do all of these different things, to plant all of or throw around all of these different seeds. How do you in that like maintain balance? Like how do you prioritize your responsibilities and what advice might you have for physicians who are also aspiring to pursue diverse interests? First, you have to acknowledge how important balance is. If you are going to do balance for balance sake, it's like you filling out a wellness module and says, oh, I know wellness. No, I'm, for me, being forced to fill out a module so that a residency or med school program can check off the wellness box adds more stress to my life. I don't feel well at all that you're going to make me fill a module in wellness so that you can check off your wellness box where I'm like, I can add another module to my thing. So if I don't truly believe in it and I don't believe in wellness and balance, then I'm not going to give it the honor or integrity that it's that, that it need, that it deserves. I think everyone has to focus on wellness and balance, but only if you want it. Only if you recognize the importance of it. I can bring you to water, but I can't make you drink it. I can tell you how important it is, but unless you want to recognize the importance, I can't make you to absorb it into your own DNA. I can only help the people that want the help. And if you want to believe in wellness and prioritize the importance of it in your budding career as a future physician, you have to go through the journey of really understanding why it's how it's important. I was forced on. It was forced on, sorry, it was forced onto me because my dad died when I was young. I, I don't go back to this often, but like, it was so sudden. One minute, you're like, oh yeah, I have a mom and dad that was never around, but at least they're around. And the next minute, the universe is like, oh, you're on your own. The only anchor I could rely on was myself. So I had to prioritize myself and balancing myself because I had no one else. My, I mean, I had friends that wanted to be there for me, but I it was just starting to make friends. Remember, my parents didn't let me have, made me feel guilty for making friends for my most of my childhood. I had to make friends in secret. A lot of things I was enjoying doing was in secret. I still feel a sense of guilt to this day when I have fun looking over my shoulders, like, wait a minute, should I do, should I be doing homework? I would still have dreams, like maybe I should be studying for an exam instead of traveling the world. And then I would wake up and I'm like, wait a minute, I'm board certified. What exams? It's just like, I still feel that. It's still like, ah. So I have to remind myself, and that's my advice to all of you, is to remind yourself, make a mantra, to always plan the fun things first. And I say that a lot, not to say that you should only plan the fun things. So a lot of people misconstrue that when I say that. Oh, he's just so privileged and, you know, he's, he's lucky that, you know, he's, he's, that's why he can plan the fun things. Or, oh, he can say that now because he's a doctor. No, I have always done that even when I was about to drop out of college the summer my dad died because I had no way to pay for my tuition. Though everyone's like, well, you got to buckle down and start making money so that you can pay for your tuition. Your dad's not around anymore. But I, what was the most fun thing at the time? I loved bartending. That was fun. I got to meet people. It was, I felt rebellious. My parents definitely did not want me to be a bartender. Or, they never found out. But had they found out, I was, felt rebellious. And that was fun. And it happened to make me money. So I planned that first. I mean, I also worked at a lab. That was sort of fun. You know, it didn't pay as much. And I did both. But I planned the bartending first. I prioritized that. Plan the fun things first, but not only that, so that everything around around it, you have to plan as well. The necessities, go grocery shopping, buy yourself food, cook yourself food, take care of your partners and your families. I mean, those are all important. I mean, hopefully taking care of your partner's fun too. That's part of the fun thing. But if it's not, then we have to have another conversation. But studying, all that, you will rise to the occasion. And I think it's like, well, you don't leave much time left for studying. Then how, then how did you pass med school? Well, I barely passed, but I had fun in medical school. That's, and I'm still a doctor. So I, it's kind of a win-win for me. You know, we've always heard P equals MD and I'm the chief medical officer of the New York City Marathon because I had fun volunteering for the marathon. It was that joy that I brought into that. And it wasn't that I was the smartest doctor in the room. I definitely wasn't. It wasn't that I was the hardest working. I mean, I work hard, but I wasn't like being taken advantage of or letting people take advantage of me. And I was having fun and that joy that I brought in is like, this is so much different from working in the hospital. In the hospital, patients were, it's like everyone's worst day of their lives is every day of my life. In the marathon, it's finally someone's best day of their life is my job and I get to be part of it. And I think that's what got me to where I am today, becoming a doctor because I was f having fun. I was planning the fun thing. So I was recharging my cup. And I also was teaching that I was prior teaching myself that I was prioritizing myself. I was my own anchor. And by filling my own cup, I had so much now left to give 
to the people around me, starting with the people I love and then all the things that I kind of enjoy doing or eating, like grocery shopping is kind of fun if you think about it. You're buying food for yourself, but then also the studying thing. I always bring joy into studying. I mean, it still sucked a lot of me, but I had so much at this point in my cup that no matter how crappy studying felt, I was doing it with a, a smile on face because man, 10 minutes ago, I was having a coffee with someone that I liked or you know, having an amazing conversation in a different country in, in like two days ago. So the, it's about the order in which you do things. And if I plan the studying part first, I'll be so mentally drained and miserable that I have no energy left to plan a trip. And then I'll just be watching TV the whole time or you know, playing this or you know, a board game or a video game, which is not bad. But like, if I only did that, then it's, I'm not in that positive feedback loop. And the second thing I would recommend other than planning the fun things first and not only the fun things is get it done early. Don't procrastinate. I know that's the hardest thing. That's a lot of people know like, ah, I don't agree with this guy. That and getting a lot of sleep. Get it done early. Don't procrastinate. If you can do it now or yesterday, get it done. Just You just never know. That is also my weakness in that. I know this is a, like, oh, it's like a job interview. What's your biggest weakness? I get things done early. Yeah, sometimes I overdo it and then I realize I didn't have to. And I was like, well, what a waste of time. I could have just waited it out and it would self-declare. But most of the time I try not to procrastinate and I get nine hours of sleep every night. If I can't, couldn't, like during med school, I try to get at least an accumulative uh, nine hours through naps during the day. Because when, once I'm really well rested, I'm more efficient to get the things I don't like to do much more quickly. That plus filling my cup with joy and fun things first, I fi finish the things I don't like even more quickly so that I have more free time to do the things I love and more free time to sleep to then feel like awake enough to do the things I don't like more quickly, even more quickly. Invest in your relationships. So anytime someone reaches out to you in your future, as you're going through med school, you better follow through. Never flake. The biggest pet peeve I have is someone who flakes on their plans. I understand that things happen, but when it becomes a pattern, you are being taken advantage of, and I hate being treated like a reservation app. I'm not a resi app. I am a human being that has feelings, and I never that flake of my friends or my relationships. I always invest in it. I always show up knowing that this person is another human being that will help me one day and vice versa. Not in like a trans transactional way, but in a supportive way. Who are we without each other? I know that we are all, we are our own anchors, but anchors are part of something bigger, like a ship full of people. And you are your own anchor so that you can be supportive to the people that depend on your anchor. And that's the people that you love. And that's what you're investing in. And they, in turn, if they feel that investment, will support you when it's your turn that needs a little stronger anchor than just yourself. And that's why not a transactional way, but more like it's life is more fun when you share happiness. Happiness is best shared. And then, you know, don't, and then with all this irony, the irony is, do this with enough of a habit and practice that it becomes just part of you emotionally. So don't think, just do. That takes practice. That's what we always call like meditation a practice. Yoga is a practice. Going to the gym. Practice is enough so that it becomes part of you. So it's your mantra and it's in your DNA so that you don't have to think anymore. You can just enjoy it. If you constantly think, wow, this is a beautiful ocean. You don't actually really appreciate how beautiful the ocean is. You got to let go of even the thought to actually feel all the feelings that are beyond words and human comprehension. Yeah, like really be present with that experience. I really like your mantra to do the fun things first. Fun things first and following the joy. And I can see in your journey how following your path of joy, what you what lights you up, what makes you feel alive, following those things have led you to have this just incredible journey, even though there were things that were unexpected that you wouldn't have planned. But it sounds like your practice, your tenacity, your desire to follow what it is that brings you joy, what it is that is the uplifting aspect of the experience has led you to where you are. You don't kind of just sit and wallow in something that's unpleasant but you're willing to shift towards what it is that you want. And I can only imagine how many other doctors' lives would be impacted and, and changed through, through, that, through that lens. I know with your memoir, The Monsoon Diaries, now distributed globally, you have this ability to reach so many other people. What legacy do you hope to leave, especially in the context of 
you know, inspiring fellow physicians to um, embrace unconventional paths, right? And really find fulfillment outside of just medicine. The legacy is to to let people know in the hardest of their hearts that it's possible, that the life that you are, you want for yourself, that you're imagining, or you're thinking, you listen to about my life and like, man, I wish I had some aspect of that joy, not necessarily have exactly my life, but some aspect of it, just the legacy to, is to know that it is actually possible, but there you have to do the work and the work doesn't have to be brutal work. It could be a change in the way you, as you said, lens. I actually find joy in wallowing. I like crying on a plane, watching a movie that makes me ah feel it tears my heart apart. I actually find joy in saying goodbye to someone I know I'm never going to see them again. And they literally turned my life upside down, whether it was emotionally, romantically, intellectually, and knowing that we this is it. I didn't enjoy my dad's passing, but I found joy in the writing that helped me cope with my dad's death. I found joy in the last minute speech I had to give at his wake, that the find joy in the, the life that he lived, even though it was his life and not our life because we didn't sh- have much time to really share our life. But I knew that at some point before he had me, he was a younger version of the man that I knew that was having fun, that was innocent, that hadn't went through the traumas that he had to go through that be- I guess turned him the guy that he, that I knew as a father and choosing what to worship. Maybe it was totally untrue. Maybe he was always angry and overbearing f- for all his life since he was one years old. But I choose not to believe that. It's not possible to me because I choose not to. And if I'm not hurting anyone in believing that it's possible, then why not choose to believe that it's possible and therefore worship that and finding joy and talking about what a life that he imagine what his life used to be like before he had me and the, the life that he lived so that when I spoke about it in the funeral, all this came out. And I was like, realized, oh, that was my first public speaking. And I realized how much I enjoyed it. And I was a, grew up a painfully shy, introverted guy with a stutter. And I could not talk in front of anything. I couldn't talk to a rock. And here I was, you know, it, but it put in the middle of it, you have to speak. Oh. And then really had a pre-written speech that I was going to read word for word. It'd be super dry. I just threw it, I tore to shreds and I just gave it off the cuff. And then just thing, this thing happened where I was like, you know what, let me just make up a, uh, a, a version of my father that I want to love. And it just came out. And here I was that, I mean, it was definitely based on some truth because, you know, at that time I was going through his closet and I found all these diaries that he wrote to my brother when he was going through a divorce. So we have different mothers. And the irony is that my brother never read it, but I ended up finding it and I read it and I found out the kind of person that he was. And that's the the person I wanted to talk about. And then realizing you can make anything possible. And then, so th- those of you listening to my story, Try if I can transcribe that energy and transition that to you, whoever is listening, to know that it is possible. If you're out there and you're like, I can't really imagine myself being a doctor and enjoying my life and still getting through medical school, and I'm terrible. I'm a terrible student. Well, listen to my story. I didn't know I wanted to be a doctor. I became very honest with my intentions when I applied to medical school. I told people I wasn't sure. That honesty is what I think got people to be interested in, or the right people. I mean, I didn't get in everywhere. I got into a few medical schools, but those few believed in me more than I believed in myself. And that led me to the next step where I did not do well in medical school. I was class president. So I think that because I enjoyed being in med school for that reason, but as a student, I always barely got by. And I did fail a few things. I got a 230 something. I, I got a 30 in an MCAT. I don't know. I think that's just mediocre right now, whatever the score is. I got a 230 in my step one. I was told to do better in step two. Otherwise, I was never getting to residency by my dean. And I ended up getting a 204. So I got did worse. And I still got to residency because the person I was interviewing me was like, hey, you're a terrible student, but you're a weird, fascinating person. We want to get to know you. And I told them, And then when they asked me, why do you want to be a doctor? I was like, well, I'm still bartending because I didn't give that up. I was still bartending at the time, pay for med school and my trips. I was like, I, bartending is the closest thing to emergency medicine and bartending is my favorite job. Emergency medicine is the closest thing to bartending. You are the boss, my bar manager, not doing anything. And I'm going to be your resident, like a bartender, trying to take care of as many people as possible in a short amount of time. And 
I got to make people love me in the, in the five minutes I have with them before I move to the next person. If I can't move too quickly, I can't move too slowly. And you, before they leave the bar, you're like the manager's like, hey, give this guy a Tylenol in the house. It's that answer because it was so honest and I didn't know what to say otherwise because they literally said, why do you want to be a doctor if you're such a bad student? That honesty is what got them to take them to say, that was the best damn answer to I've ever heard to that question. You got the job and I matched in one of the top emergency medicine programs in New York City and the oldest in New York City. So that doesn't make sense to me as it's happening. But for those of you listening, that all did happen. And therefore, if it did happen, it can happen to you. And yes, it may sound like I'm really, really lucky, but what is luck but opportunity plus preparation? I worked really hard to get that point. I never gave up on the bartending. I never gave up on the traveling. That was hard work to keep that while as a medical student because I wanted to plan that first without giving up a med school. And because I didn't give up on traveling and bartending, all the things that brought me joy, I had enough to actually survive medical school. And that's what got me to become the doctor I am today. I'm not my father's doctor. I'm not the doctor that my dad imagined me. I'm not a doctor because my dad wanted me to be a doctor. I'm a doctor because the universe made me the doctor that I wanted to be. And I can claim that this story is still is mine to own, not my dad's. So I still became a doctor. My, my dad had his wish come true. But I don't feel like I gave in to anyone other than my own self and the universe would have ha- asked me. So the what of it all is still the same. I'm still a doctor, but the how, the crazy all over the place thing, that's yours to keep. That is your own story. And no matter what you become, it's the how. At the end of the day, when you look back on your life and you have all a family, a kids, whoever you're with, or just even yourself and, or the universe, and you're having that conversation with them on your deathbed, what kind of story do you want to tell them at the end of the day? That you did everything else because everyone told you to do it a certain way? Or you said, screw it, I'm just going to do it my way and trust the process and live the process. And I'd rather be surprised than have everything fall exactly according to plan. So the latter, if you have no idea and you're not sure, it is a perfectly valid next step to say, I have no idea what the next step is. Once you acknowledge that rather than pretend, oh, I know exactly what I'm doing. Oh, I know. I don't worry. I got this. And just acknowledge, I have no idea what I'm doing. That's the next step. No idea. No, no plan. That's my next step. You let the, uh, that letting go, actually declaring, I have no idea, opens up all these doors and possibilities. All that anxiety about wondering what the next step is gone because you just squashed it by saying, I have no idea. And to finally owning that and declaring that rather than pretending that you do have an idea, that's what the space that leads you to the next step and it, it, that it is possible. So live the process and trust in it. Thank you so much, Dr. Sun. That was so amazing. Just the power of authenticity and living life on your own terms and following your passions and where it could actually lead. So your insights, your journey has been incredibly enlightening and inspiring to us all. For those who are wanting to learn more about you, to travel with you for sure, where can our listeners find you? It's really funny you were doing this interview and I like literally walked across the street and someone was like, oh, my, my cousin traveled on your trips. <laughs> so find me and run me run into me in the street and they like took me on Instagram and I was like, oh, I'm going to come on your trips. And I'm like, I, I, it was, I think it was like an Uber Eats driver or something that like came by and was like, oh yeah, like I know you. So I guess that's how you find me, you serendipity. But if you want to make an effort, uh, most people find me through monsoondiaries.com. Uh, you can also Google The Monsoon Diaries. Hopefully, it's still one of the first things to, to pop up. There's my book, The Monsoon Diaries, published by HarperCollins Publishers. And it's available everywhere where books are sold, brick and mortar, Barnes and & Noble, and Books a Million, and Borders, Amazon. And you can get an ebook on Kindle or Google or Apple, whatever that sells ebooks. And then there's the audiobook that I was lucky enough to record, as well as the very famous CNN journalist, Lisa Ling, uh, wrote my forward and also recorded her part for the audiobook. So if you want to listen to a book, it's also available on most platforms and or just get a signed copy at any bookstore that I have frequent, I've stopped by at, which is usually New York City or the uh, metropolitan area. If you want to come on my trips, everything's on the website, monsoondiaries.com. And on social media, you can go on Instagram or Facebook. The handle is Monsoon Diaries. That's Monsoon as in the weather pattern, M-O-N-S-O-O-N, Diaries, D-I-A-R-I-E-S. Just think Monsoon Waiting plus Motorcycle Diaries. Mash together. 
which is the inspiration for the title. Just all you gotta do is send me a message. I respond to everything and happy to reply as long as it's respectable and curious. And, and that's my next piece of advice. Stay curious, it'll lead to the next step. If you stay curious, I will match that energy and hopefully I can be part of your journey because I'm at that point right, right now when I wanna see other people also find their authentic self. Beautiful, beautiful. So we appreciate your presence for this episode of the Physician's Guide to Doctoring podcast. A heartfelt thank you to Dr. Sun for generously sharing his insights and offering a glimpse into the transformative journey from physician to multifaceted entrepreneur and adventurer. If you enjoyed this episode and want to connect, you can learn more about me at physiciansguidetodoctoring.com or at slash Dr. Goins. Please consider subscribing to the podcast and leaving a review. Your feedback is invaluable in helping us to continue to provide meaningful content to physicians and their families. Stay tuned for upcoming episodes featuring more intriguing discussions, expert interviews, and practical advice to elevate both your personal and professional life. Visit our website for additional resources in detail. Show notes as physicians, we navigate the dual responsibilities of caring for our patients and caring for ourselves. So striking that balance is paramount and our podcast is here to support you throughout this journey. Thanks for being an essential part of our community. We eagerly anticipate sharing more knowledge and experiences in episodes to come. And until next time, take care, stay well, and continue to make a positive impact on the world. Thank you. Thanks again from Heidi. Elevate your practice with a free AI scribe, zero cost, HIPAA compliant, and time saving. Ready to swap? We've got you covered for past AI scribe expenses. Head to HeidiHealth.com, get started, and make your practice the envy of every stethoscope in town. Thanks for listening. I have a favor to ask. You listened to the episode until the end, which means you either fell asleep or you really liked the episode. So please share it or like it or comment on a social media post or write us a five-star review, something. It would really help me out. And maybe what you learned from this episode can help someone else too. The views expressed in this episode are those of the interviewer and interviewee and don't represent the views of their employer or even their significant other. Even though the magic of podcasting make it sound like I'm talking directly to you, this is not a doctor-patient relationship and this is not medical advice or financial advice or really any advice. Thank us again for listening to the Physician's Guide to Doctoring.